people. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 10 and 11. And uh, in fact, let's just go ahead and read verse 12 as well as we look at this passage of Scripture. 2 Samuel chapter 6. As you well know, for the last several, several weeks, we've been going into the uh, Old Testament and looking at some Old Testament saints that perhaps you're not as familiar with. And so we've looked at several different ones. Today we're going to look at another man by the name of Obadiah. Obadiah was a man that God used in a very special, special way. And we're going to see that in just a few moments. So with your Bibles open, would I like to invite you to stand with me in reverence of reading God's holy word. 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we begin reading in verse 10. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took a side into the house of Obededom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obededom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obededom and all his household. Now it was told that King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obededom, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obadiah to the city of David with gladness. Father, may the Spirit of God be upon the preaching of your word. Lord, we're so dependent upon you. We ask, dear Lord, that you may use this vessel to bring forth the words to your people. They come hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. May the anointing and the filling of your spirit be upon us here today is our prayer. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Professor Nick Stinnett, he's a professor of human services of the University of Nebraska. He did a worldwide study of the home. He began to question and survey more than 3,000 different homes black and white, red and yellow. It didn't matter. He was looking at all different cultures, North America, South America, Europe, Asia. He was looking at all different cultures. And to his findings, he had found that they were six qualities of a strong family. When I saw the caption of that headline of that article, I was interested in wanting to know what are the six qualities of a strong Christian family. Well, this was his findings. I want you to notice with me these findings. First of all, I want you to say that they were committed to the family, that the husband and the wife and the children They looked to the family and they realized this was an important, important role in society. So they were committed to the family. Second of all, that they would spend time together. That they realized that the importance of spending time together. Thirdly, that they would have a good family communication. That they would be able to communicate with one another. And then fourthly, They would express appreciation to each other. 
And then fifthly, they have a spiritual commitment. Ah, I thought I was waiting for that. And then number six, he says they're able to solve problems in a crisis. I thought that these qualities was very important. You may, as you were reading these different qualities that was found in a strong family, maybe you have even took a survey of your own family. And you began to ask the question, do I express, do my family express these different qualities and characteristics of a strong family? But I would go so far to say, in my opinion, that the spiritual commitment is the number one priority. The spiritual commitment of when a man and a woman comes together and realizes the importance of the role of a husband and wife, coming to the role of father and mother and children, sons and daughters, and to understand the proper role that they play in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is of the utmost importance. M.R. Dehan made this statement. He said that the nearest thing to heaven on earth is the Christian family and the home where husband and wife and parents and children live in love and peace together for the Lord and for each other. Then he went on as far to say the nearest thing to hell on earth is an ungodly home, broken by sin and iniquity and separated, and children are abandoned to the devil and all the forces of the wickedness. I believe he's right on target. That the closest thing to heaven is a Christian family, committed, growing in the Lord, walking in the Lord, closest thing to heaven that you can have is a good, godly Christian home. And yet, at the same time, the closest thing to hell is where there is sin, iniquity, fighting, and all the disgruntles that we find in many, many different homes today. Today, we're going to talk about a home that God blessed And God used in a very special, special way. Now, the background of the setting of the story here has to do with the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to notice, first of all, if you're keeping notes and following my outline on the back of your bulletin, that the first thing I want you to notice with me, the death that is attributed to the Ark. Now, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there, for his era, and he died there by the ark of God. My goodness, what in the world happened here? The background of the story here, of course, is around a very sacred piece of furniture called the ark of the covenant. The ark, of course, was placed in the most holy place there in the tabernacle. I want you to see a picture of the ark as we might show it at this particular time. Here, as you see it, it's a beautiful piece of furniture. It's three feet, nine inches long, and it's two feet, three inches wide, as well as two feet, three inches high. You'll notice it's overladen by gold. And there on the top is the mercy seat. 
And there it was always represented as the glory of God, the presence of God. And so you see inside the ark, there inside the ark was, of course, the law, the tablets of the law. And then, of course, the covenant. And then there was the manna that was given during the days as Moses and the children of Israel was in the wilderness. And then, of course, Aaron's rod that budded. And that was inside the ark. The ark represented God's presence. The ark represented God's protection and God's provision and God's glory. And so the ark was held to the most high. But one of the darkest days in the life of the Israelites was when the Philistines came and they stole the ark. And there they took it to their God, Dagon, and placed it there in that tabernacle of their God. And more than 40 years the ark had been separated from the children of Israel. David now comes upon the throne. Nowhere do you find that Saul ever had an interest in the ark. But David, once he came on the throne, that one of his primary ambitions was to bring the ark back to the city of David, Jerusalem where the presence of God, the glory of God would be there once again in that place. And so what David does, he chooses out 30,000 special men and they go down into the Philistine community and there they retake that ark. Oh, you should see, it's a special occasion as they have now the ark with them. And they're journeying back to Jerusalem. And as they're journeying back to Jerusalem, they're singing, they're dancing, they're playing instruments. It's a joyous occasion that the glory of God has now once again, we're with them. But something happened. Something happened as they had placed it on the back of a cart. And the oxen was carrying or pulling that cart that he stumbled. And when he stumbled, the ark fell to the side. And about that time, the ark began to fall off of that cart. And there was a man by the name of Uzzah. And he puts his hand up and he holds the ark up and keeps it steady from falling to the ground. Something strange happened. The moment that he touched the ark, he dies. God strikes him dead. Now, That little experience tells us two things. It tells us something about Yuza, and then it also tells us something about the character of God. Yuza loved the ark. Yuza was a man that was trying to protect the ark. So why in the world would God kill a man? that was trying to protect the ark. Well, it also says something about the character of God. The character of God. Saying that the sinfulness of humanity is not to touch God. Now, I want you to notice a couple things as we think about this situation. First of all, the person of God is to be reverenced. The person of God is to be referenced. He tells us that God is holy. We sung about that today. He is holy, holy, thrice holy God. The ark was not to be touched by human hands. 
You'll notice on the outside of that ark, there were two staffs. And there was supposed to be two long poles going through those staffs. And there, the priests, the priestly men who were consecrated by God were the only ones that were supposed to carry the ark. And they were supposed to place them upon the shoulders of these priests. Never intended to be put on the back of a cart. Never intended to be touched by the human hands of sinful man. My friend, I want to remind you that we need to be in in subjection to the holiness of God. God is holy, and we need to reverence that fact. I always have a problem when I hear somebody talk about the man upstairs. I always have a problem when they talk about the big daddy in the sky. My friend, I want you to understand, God is holy. Holy, and he expects us to reverence him and to reverence his name. And therefore, there is a serious, serious consequence when you do not reverence the name of God. Nothing irritates me and upsets me anymore when I hear the precious name of God taken in vain. Oh, how horrible. And so what God was trying to tell us, that this was, of course, we need to reverence the person of God. But not only the reverence of the person of God, but also the precepts of God are to be respected. In other words, the death of Uzzah was more than David's fault than it was anybody else. David was the one that commanded them to take the Ark of the Covenant and to put it on the back of that cart. David should have known better. My friend, I want you to understand, God had declared the Ark to be carried and not to be placed on a cart. Therefore, he's talking about to us the Word of God is to be respected. That's why we stand when we read the Word of God. We're respecting the Word of God. I'm amazed of how we take lightly of the Word of God, my friend. The statues of the Lord, they are to be followed. My friend, I want you to understand the laws of God are to be obeyed. And so we get sort of a background. But second of all, let's get down to the meat of the story. The dwelling that was allowed for the ark. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 9, or chapter 6, verse 9 and 11, David was afraid of the Lord that day. You can imagine. One of his men touching the ark, and immediately he dies. I'd be afraid too. How can the ark of the Lord come to me, he says. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside in the house of Obedim, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedim, the Gittite. What happened? As they were journeying from the land of the Philistines on their way to Jerusalem, this experience happens. And immediately fear fell upon David and upon the people of Israel. Why, what are we to do with this ark? Just so happened, as they were passing along the roadside, there was a house, a house of Obedidim. And there, Obedidim invited David to bring the ark into his house. 
What? Other people would say, I would not touch this ark. And yet, Obi-Edom invited David to bring the ark to his house. You'll notice here that we see that his home was offered to God. It says in verse 10, So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obi-Edom the Gittite. I can just imagine everyone was terrified, but not Obi-Edom. I'm not sure about his wife. I can almost imagine news got out that you don't touch this ark. You better be a, stay clear from this ark. And she comes home one day, and there the ark is in her living room. <laughs> what have you done? You have messed up our house. I don't want my children playing around it. I don't want to be around it. What have you done? He had a lot to explain. But oh, my, my, my. Obedum. He opened his home to the Lord. Now, friend, I want you to understand. That is so important. You can't ask God to bless your home unless you're willing to allow him to be in your home. You can't allow, you can't ask God to bless your children unless you've allowed God to be in the center of the attention of your home. I can almost imagine right there in the center of that house sits this beautiful gold-laid box, ark. The presence of God, the glory of God, the protection of God, the provision of God right there where it always has set in the holy place there in the tabernacle. Oh, my, my. One of the greatest things that a husband, a mother, and a father, a wife can do is to invite God into their home. Amen. Lord, this is your home. You are welcome here. If somebody would walk into your home, would they recognize it as a home of God? If they would listen to the conversation that is going on into that home, Day after day. Would they recognize that the presence of God is in that home? If they were watching you behind closed doors, would they recognize that the presence of God is in that home? Friend, I'm here to tell you the presence of God will change your home. And it will change it for the good. But not only did he, we see his heart was open to the Lord. I mean, his home was open to the Lord, but his heart was open to the Lord. My friend, I want you to notice something very interesting. In verse 10, it says, Obedium was a Gittite. In other words, he was from Gath of the Philistines. Gath, of course, was one of the primary places of where the temple of Dagon was. Dagon was recognized among the Philistines as the greatest god of all gods. And so they were idol worshipers. And yet, here is a Philistine of all people. Something must have happened in the life of this man. 
See, you're not going to invite somebody into your home if you haven't already invited them in your heart. Something had happened in the life of Obedidum. I don't know exactly what happened, but I believe that when he heard that this was the ark of God, that this was a God that he wanted to worship. This was a God that he wanted to serve. This was a God that he wanted to be in his house. And so I believe there was a time and a place that he had turned from the false gods to the one true God, the Lord God Almighty. I ask you the question today, have you opened your heart to the Lord? Oh, there's a lot of parents that says, I don't mind my children going to church, but I don't have time for it. I remember hearing about one little boy talking to his dad, him and his dad, as they were sitting there in the living room, and his dad had a can of beer in his hand. Somebody knocked on the door. And it was two deacons from the church down the street had come by to welcome this family into the community and to invite them to come to church. And then began to witness to this man. And of course the man said, well, I'm not interested at this time. And he heard them away. And the little boy said to the father after they left, he said, we don't want their old God, do we, Daddy? What a tragedy. What a tragedy that our children would learn such a thing from us today. See, listen to me, Dad. Listen to me, Mom. If you want to teach your children about the things of God, you must demonstrate it, demonstrate it in your life. And if he is not demonstrated in your life, I don't care what you say, my friend, they're not going to hear you. Obedum, no doubt, had invited the Lord into his life. And therefore, he invited him into his home. But one last thing I want you to notice here with me, and that is the dividends that is associated with the ark. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedom, the Gittite, for three months. Now, can you imagine... And the Bible said, listen to this, underline it. And the Lord blessed Obedum and all his house hold. Those three months was a life-changing experience for the household of Obedum. Three months. After three months, I can almost imagine. Obi Edom had been blessed. His wife had been blessed. His children had been blessed. And the presence and the glory of God was upon that household. Oh. David says we must take the ark back home into Jerusalem. Obi-Edom comes into the house and tells his wife, well, the ark must leave. What? He can't, you, they can't take the ark. Oh, how our lives have been changed, how our lives have been touched. Oh, don't take the ark. But it must be taken. Must be taken. My friend, those three months, no doubt, was a blessing. It meant that they had a special home. 
It meant that days to come, people would talk about the ark resting once again in Jerusalem. But Obed-Edom could say, ah, it also was in my home for three months. No one else could say that. No one else could say it had rested in my home. David was so impressed with Obed-Edom and his household and how God had blessed that home that he invited Obed-Edom to come with him to Jerusalem. And not only invited him to come to Jerusalem, but to become the gatekeeper of the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, my. How God blesses. It's amazing when you allow God to come into your home. It's amazing when you allow God's blessings be upon you of how he blesses you beyond your ever expectations. Children growing up fearing God. Children growing up loving the Lord. Children growing up and demonstrating the Christ that you've taught them for years to be like. Oh, what a blessing. William Lyon Phelps, the American educator, said these words, The highest happiness on earth is in marriage. Every man who is happily married is a successful man, and even if he had failed in everything else, he would be a success. Oh, praise the Lord for that. But it not only meant that he had a special home, but it meant that he had a spiritual home. God was in this home of Obedidium. His home, do you realize what happened? His home became the temple. His home became a sanctuary. The ark Changed that home. The presence of God changed those people. Is it not in the home where we post to teach our children love? Is it not in the home where we teach our children respect? Is it not in a home where we teach our children work, work ethics? It's in the home. And my friend, no wonder the devil is doing everything in his power to destroy the home today. Because he knows if he can destroy the home, he has destroyed society. And that's what we're seeing today. We've got children growing up today. They don't know who their dads are. Got children growing up today. Grandparents are taking care of them, and the parents are gone. They've abandoned their children. God, help us to have spiritual homes. God, help us to have special homes where our children can grow up and feel confident. No wonder we live in a society today that people don't know where, which bathroom to go in today. Simply because we've got such a warped society and it roots right back to the home. Right back to the home. I like what J.C. Penney said. J.C. Penney said, The highest duty of parents is to build Christian homes where children can grow spiritually strong and to teach the Bible, in session and out, or in season and out of season. He said, I never apologize for better Christian homes because my entire experience tells me that the dealings between men in business, government, and social relationships are influenced for good or ill by home background. That's true. You're influenced by your home. 
dads, moms, you only get one chance. You only get one chance. And it's amazing how fast that little toddler grows up to become that teenage child. It's amazing. It's like you blink and all of a sudden they're grown. That's why you need to take advantage of the opportunity that God has given to you when those precious little children are growing up in your home. Amen. Have you invited the presence of God in your home? Amen. Have you welcomed him and said, God, this is your home and I welcome you. May your presence and your blessings and your glory be upon my household. That should be your prayer today. You say, well, Pastor, uh, one of these days I'll get around to that. One of these days it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. I challenge you today. I challenge you to evaluate your household, to evaluate your priorities. God is passing by. Have you welcomed him? Have you opened your door and said, Lord, here, make this a sanctuary for your glory and for your praise? You've got to open your heart in order to open your home. And it must come in that particular perspective. Have you done that? I invite you to do that today. Lord Jesus, what an exciting story.